started. My name is Amy, and I'm here um, today to introduce you to Andrew G. Pierce. Andrew has a master's level certified, uh, is a certified level uh, addiction professional. Uh, he's a graduate of Hazelden Betty Ford Graduate School of Addiction Studies. As a person in long-term recovery from multiple addictions, Andrew understands the addict's mind. His addiction journey has taken him from owning a multi-million dollar corporate retirement plan consulting firm to camping without power in an abandoned house to becoming one of the most respected, innovative, and knowledgeable addiction therapists in Southwest Florida. He has a private practice in Naples, Florida, under the umbrella of consulting of Southwest Florida and therapy treatment team. Additionally, he lectures on the unified theory of recovery clinical model he has developed and in which that is and which is the subject of this book, Resolving Spiritual Skepticism in Recovery, Putting the Universe to Work for You, which was published in June of 2021. To learn more about Andrew and his work, visit andrewgpierce.com. Please give a round of applause for Andrew Pierce. Hey everybody, um, today it's going to be a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, so don't feel like, uh, if you get lost, don't worry about it, I'll be sticking around afterward, I'm going to be sticking pretty much to the script for this whole thing because it takes about 55 minutes, um, and that's everything I know. So, uh, this is an experiential presentation in that you will experience the content in much the same way that your patients would when exposed to it. Field-based belief systems have played out in popular books like The Secret and The Law of Attraction over the past decades. A formal field-based change model reflecting those principles was developed out of necessity by Dr. Joe Dispenza, inspired by a spinal injury and placebo effect, or mind over matter. His book, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, outlines the model he developed, and upon reading it, I thought, wow, this is great. I could, it could be applied to healing addiction, which isn't nearly as complicated as spinal repair. So let's take a look at the general, a general overview of two principles underlying Spence's field-based change model in his own words, the need for a clear, compelling future, uh, a vision for the future, and the need to overcome psychoneurological psychoneuroimmunological homeostasis, or in terms that I can pronounce, the need to overcome the body's role in perpetuating the mental, emotional, and behavioral status quo. How many people believe in the idea that the way you think has some effect on your life? That your thoughts are intimately connected to your future? So your thoughts, in some way, create your reality. You believe that? So how many people in this audience have a clear vision of their future? You see, you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day. Out of those 60 to 70,000 thoughts that you think in one day, 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before. So if you believe that your thoughts somehow are connected to your life, then the same thoughts always lead to the same choices. The same choices always lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the same experiences, and the same experiences produce the same emotions. And those very same emotions drive the very same thoughts. And your biology, your neurocircuitry, your neurochemistry, your neurohormones, and even your genetic expression is equal to how you think, how you act, and how you feel. And how you think, how you act, and how you feel is called your personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. 
So then, if you wanted to create a new personal reality, a new life, then you would have to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and changing. You would have to become aware of your unconscious thoughts and observe them. You would have to pay attention to your automatic habits and behaviors and modify them. And you would have to look at the emotions you live by every single day that are connected to your past and decide if those emotions belong in your future. You see, most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality that doesn't work. You literally have to become someone else. So your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of all the things you've learned and experienced to this moment. So if you wake up every morning and get out of bed on the same side, shut the alarm clock off with the same finger, shuffle into the bathroom and use the toilet like you always do, go and get a cup of coffee and drink coffee out of your favorite mug, and get in the shower and wash yourself off in the same routine way, drive to work, get to work, see the same people that push the same emotional buttons, do the same things that you've memorized and do so well, then hurry up and go home, and hurry up and check your emails, and hurry up and check your Facebook, then hurry up and go to bed. Here's my question. Did your brain change at all that day? We could say that you were thinking the same thoughts, performing the same unconscious actions, living by the same emotions, but secretly expecting your life to change. So there's a principle in neuroscience. And the principle says, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. So if you're thinking the same thoughts, making the same choices, demonstrating the same behaviors, reproducing the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same patterns, and then produce the same emotions, you're going to hardwire your brain into a very finite signature. Because as you fire and wire the same circuits in the same way, those circuits begin to become more connected. And by the time you're 35 years old, this is science now, we become a set of memorized behaviors, unconscious habits, automatic emotional reactions, beliefs and perceptions, and even attitudes that function just like a computer program. And if you do something over and over and over again, the repetition of those actions over time conditions your body to know how to do it well better than your mind. And a habit is when your body knows better than your mind. Where you've done something so many times that the body now knows how to do it better than the brain. And so 95% of most people's behaviors, attitudes, thoughts, beliefs, emotional reactions are subconscious programs. So why is that important? Because you're here this week to learn new information. And every time you learn something new, you make new connections in your brain. That's what learning is. Learning is forging new synaptic connections. Physical evidence as a result of your interaction in the environment and the footprints of consciousness is called learning, making new connections. And the Nobel Prize laureate, Kandel, in the year 2000, found that when people learn one bit of information, they doubled the number of connections in their brain from 1,300 connections to 2,600 connections. 
But if they didn't review that information, if they couldn't repeat it, if they couldn't remember it, those circuits pruned apart in hours or days. So if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections. And you are here this week to learn vital information about creating the future and be defined by a vision of the future instead of the memories of the past. Because if you are not defined by some vision that is bigger than you, and you are not passionate about that vision, then you're left with the old hardware of the past in your brain, and you will be predictable in your life. So would you agree then? New thoughts, new information, should lead to new choices. New choices should lead to new behaviors. And new behaviors should create new experiences. And new experiences should produce new emotions. And those new emotions should drive new thoughts. And that's called evolution. So if your brain is a record of the past, and you don't have a vision of the future, then you are living in the past. And you will never arrive at that new future. So then if you wake up in the morning and you are not being defined by a vision that's bigger than you, and it doesn't get you out of bed and inspire you into possibility, and you get up living in the old hardware of the past and the old emotions stored in your body, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to wake up and you're going to open your eyes and you're going to see the same people and go to the same places and do the exact same thing at the exact same time. And the moment you open your eyes, all of a sudden now, it's your external environment that's controlling how you think and feel. Because you have a neurological network in your brain for every person you know every place that you go, everything that you own, everything that you do. And the moment you open your eyes and you see the same people and go to the same places and do the exact same thing at the exact same time, it's your external environment that's turning on different circuits in your brain, causing you to think equal to everything that you know. And you told me you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny. As long as you're th thinking equal to your environment, you keep creating the same life. To change, to truly change, is to think greater than your environment. To think greater than the circumstances in your life. To think greater than the conditions in your world. And every great person in history knew this. Whether it was Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, the Wright brothers, Joan of Arc. They all had a vision. Couldn't see it. Couldn't smell it. Couldn't taste it. Couldn't feel it. But it was alive in their mind. It was so alive in their mind that they began to live as if that future reality was happening in the present moment. And so the moment you stop making the same choices that you always make, Get ready because it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's the moment we're heading towards the new self. And we call it stepping into the river of change. But now, remember, 95% of who you are is your body as the mind. You know, you've done something enough times that your body does it better than your brain. So you may actually complain unconsciously because your body does it all the time. And all of a sudden you say, no complaining, no more blaming, no more feeling sorry for myself, no more talking about other people, I'm going to stop. You know what happens, don't you? The body starts sending signals to the brain. The body's been conditioned that way. And all of a sudden you start hearing the thoughts in your head that say, wow, 
Something's wrong with me. It's my mother's fault. It's my ex-husband's fault. It's my ex-wife's fault. I'm this way because of this event. Or the most important one, this doesn't feel right. And the moment you respond to that thought as if it's true, that thought leads to the same choice, which leads to the same behavior, that creates the same experience, that produces the same emotion, and the person says, this feels right. That feels familiar. Going from the old self to the new self, stepping into that void, stepping into that uncertainty, is the biological, the neurological, the chemical, the hormonal, genetic death of the old self. People will say to us, well, in that unknown, I can't predict my life or my future. And we always say the same thing to them. The best way to predict your future is to create it, not from the known, but from the unknown. And when you and I get comfortable in the place of the unknown, that's where the magic happens. And it never happens in the known. Inspiring, right? But in order to be utilized with our population, we need to address the pathology that impairs our patient's ability to even imagine a credible aspirational vision. Barriers which I have found to have originated in family of origin and were then reinforced through adulthood in familiar adult relationships and then further exacerbated by addiction. Things like paralyzing shame or the absolute belief that they do not deserve anything good. Terrifying fear of abandonment causing repression of the true self. Fear of change connected to abandonment. The idea being that if I change, everyone in my life is going to leave me. Incredibly low self-efficacy or learned helplessness. The ingrained belief that past performance guarantees future results, leading to hopelessness. And of course, the physiological pathology, the damage to the brain from chronic addiction contributes to patients' learned helplessness in the form of overly robust dopaminergic pathways between the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental areas, which we all learned about in grad school, leading to strong cravings and addictive behaviors and thoughts. In addition, reduced density and functionality of the frontal cortex structures, including the anterior cingulate cortex, which impairs patients' ability to accurately self-assess. Damage to the orbital frontal cortex results in misvaluation of priorities and people in their life. And reduced function in the insular cortex affects, among other things, patients' ability to connect the dots between their behaviors and the consequences and then accurately empathize with loved ones who are already undervalued due to damage to the orbital frontal cortex. So all of these factors conspire against our patient's ability to aspire wholeheartedly. So my clinical model, which I coined the Unified Theory of Recovery, or UTR for short, is adapted to overcome these barriers that are unique to the addicted and those in early recovery, which impair their ability to fully engage in a field-based change model. There are five primary overlays to my change model. I call them overlays because although they are introduced linearly in much the same manner they're being presented today, they are woven together and ultimately work concurrently throughout the patient's treatment episode. The handout accompanying this presentation shows how all the model's concepts are interlaced, again, thus the name Unified Theory of Recovery. Um, so stage one recovery involves implementing traditional recovery methods such as psychoeducation on addiction, resolving cognitive distortions like control fallacy, polarized thinking, minimization, catastrophizing, all our favorites, and facilitating clients' ability to join the recovery community by way of mutual support groups like AA, NA, CODA, Smart Recovery, etc., whatever is appropriate for them as well as addressing underlying mental health issues, fueling addiction like mood disorders, OCD, and so on. Stage two recovery involves what I call the authentication process where I help patients recover their true self, which was abandoned as a, as a survival mechanism early on in patient's development in order to cope with childhood environmental factors like dysfunctional family of origin, 
which may have included uh, adverse childhood experiences, harsh judgmentalism, shaming, family addiction, abuse, trauma, neglect, etc. The magic wand experiment is where I give patients a magic wand and they describe in detail what both they and their perfect world would be like if time and money were no object. Essentially, heaven on earth. Number four, we provide education on the science based field based on the science behind the field based change model, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then we finally pull everything together for the doing aspect of the model once everything else is kind of understood, which is engaging in guided quantum medications, of which many are available on Amazon and YouTube, among other resources. So that's those are the overlays involved in this field based change process. Now, I'd like to go over <clears throat> how I help patients develop a compelling vision of their future that has both substance, depth, and emotion, because we really need to have a, a compelling beacon on the horizon to plant there, because if you know what you really, truly want, you have 359 degrees of what to ignore, so it really simplifies their life, right? So after providing psychoeducation on on you know, psychoneuroimmunology, that mind-body connection. You know, there's seven times more channels going into the brain than coming out of the brain, and so that has to be reconciled with time. I like to use the example of how our body chemistry, especially in early recovery, any time we make a fundamental shift or a decision to change, it affects our, uh, we might change our mind. It's like going to the gym January 1st, right? By the end of the second week, the gym's empty again. It's because our physiology is informing our unconscious and then our conscious thoughts, which then lead to behaviors and so on. So that has to be overcome. So I provide psychoeducation for the patients on that, <clears throat> where the mind body, uh, the body becomes habituated, making change difficult. I lay out the process, usually drawing it out on an inkboard, explaining what I mean so that patients can gain a visual overview of what they're attempting to accomplish. Um, in the magic wand thought experiments, essentially a supersized solution-focused therapeutic intervention that we might employ when a patient complains about how things are on a day-to-day -day basis, and we ask them, well, how would you like things to be, right? When done properly, this exercise reveals pathology, such as shame, learned helplessness, trauma, and other barriers, which can help them throughout the therapeutic episode. Uh, so often I'll give somebody a, a handout with the magic wand thought experiment and they'll come back with some pathetic two-paragraph thing saying, well, I wanted to be realistic and so on. And so all, all of the conversation involved in developing the magic wand thought experiment reveals pathology that's related to the things that, we talk, that I talked about earlier that can be resolved. More importantly, it gives the patients, though, the magic wand thought experiment focus. Uh, again, when they know what they do want, they can gain clarity as to what they don't want. Uh, patients engaged in this intervention tend to fully buy into the process because possibly for the first time ever, it's their vision that they're working toward and nobody else's. On the left are the dimensions I have patients flesh out in terms of what they truly want if handed a magic wand. Uh, on the right, the fourth dimension of their 4D vision uh, involves the emotions that they will experience when they occupy their ideal reality. So the capstone experience of this magic wand thought experiment entails a letter from the patient's future self residing in their idealized world to their present self. This letter needs to be emotionally believable to the extent that anyone reading it could visualize that reality with as much clarity as the patient. They're essentially occupying that version of themselves throughout this process. Once the vision is complete, I then move on to the values exercise where I ask the patient, you know, what kind of values does your idealized self possess? I have a list of about 400 from which they choose. After selecting about 20, I have them pare that list down to 10 as there's usually a lot of overlap among the values in their initial pass. And then we rank them, creating a hierarchy from most important to least most important of their core values that they aspire to or that they may already possess. For the sake of expediency, I used my own hierarchy here and bolded my aspirational values, those being the ones that I either never had or lost when I abandoned my true self uh, along the way. The others I always possessed to some degree over the years, but I still ascribe to. 
Authenticity will always be the first value, no matter what, as it is necessary in asserting the stage two true self recovered during this process, because it's only by asserting their true self that they're able to get feedback that disconfirms their preconceptions about who they are. It, it, it disconfirms their shame-based personality. And during this process, the values process, it is an opportunity to be vigilant for uh, counter-transference because it's easy to want to impose our values on them. The final step in the patient, uh, in, the, in the magic wand thought experiment is when the patient identifies tangible experiences aligned with their highest values that their idealized self may have or that they may experience now. This creates hope for the future and happiness for the present and proves to the patients that they don't have to wait until their vision is fully realized in order to be happy. The overriding principle being that living life aligned with our highest values creates happiness and decreases stress and therefore fuel for the desire to self-medicate. During the remainder of the treatment episode, we look for discrepancy between identification of these activities and implementation of them so that we can address why they're not doing these things. So that's the magic wand thought experiment. Um, once that's done, we have to help patients overcome the learned helplessness by explaining the science that enables them to actually engage this change. And this is where you're probably going to start feeling like you're in a physics class, and that's okay. You don't have to memorize any of this stuff. Again, it's, I'm happy to uh, refer you to whatever you need to to answer any questions, and I'll be sticking around later. So the science portion of uh, the Unified Theory of Recovery Therapeutic episode is intended to remove all doubt in patients' belief in their ability to occupy that idealized self in reality that they've defined in their magic wand thought experiment. In order to do this, it's useful to get them to question their worldview as they know it now, and quantum mechanics is one of the best ways to do that so that their old limiting belief system uh, can be replaced with one that is both truly accurate and conducive to profound fundamental change of identity in a remarkably short period of time, going from being a drinker, essentially, to being a former drinker. Okay? I like to say that a person in early recovery is someone with an identity crisis having an identity crisis, and that seems to be the case. So this is a good place to start. Um, over a century or so, particle theory, exemplified here, worked pretty well for physicists in explaining many things, but it was never able to account for things like consciousness, awareness, or the ghost in the machine, if you will. Uh, the scientists felt no need to account for such subjective nonsense as the concept of self-awareness as science is, is purely objective and so they didn't have a need for subjectivity. We don't work in that realm, but we can leverage uh, physics to make our point to the super skeptical patients that have problems with spirituality. We're going to see how that works in a minute. But particle theory did explain nearly all observable phenomena until we eventually developed better and better tools to explore the nature of reality at its most fundamental subatomic level. And it's important for our purpose to note that all physical matter, you, me, and everything, is really composed of only three fundamental particles. The quarks, which make up the new protons and neutrons, there's two kinds of quarks, an up quark and a down quark. Uh, we're not going to get too caught up in that. But a proton has two up quarks and a down quark. And a neutron has two down quarks and an up quark. And then finally, the electron is the thing that we all know about that swirls all over the place. By the way, this is not in scale, which is a really important aspect of this model because if you blew the nucleus of a hydrogen atom, which has one proton, one neutron, and electron, up to the size of a golf ball, the potential range where that electron, single electron could be would be three miles across. So it's mostly empty space, which is part of the deal, right? This physicists ask, well, what's the deal with all of that empty space? And that's kind of where this field theory stuff comes in, because it explains how that works. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the up quarks, down quarks, you and I are basically made up, those are our three fundamental particle, molecule, particles that make up atoms, that make up molecules, and eventually make up us, and paper towel holders, and chairs, and projectors, and stuff like that. So, the, but the following experiment shook scientists' worldview, because they, they could never reconcile consciousness and material reality. 
It was the famed double slit experiment that, much to the chagrin of phys physicists, brought to light the intersection of immaterial consciousness and material reality. So let's watch.
Okay, so that should freak you out a little bit, hopefully. Um, bottom line is, if we don't observe or know which path the electron look, took through the slits, then the system is in a state of superposition where all possible realities exist, resulting in that interference pattern that we saw, reflecting that the electron through, essentially went through both, neither one or the other. But if we have knowledge uh, by observing which path the electron takes, it always discharges its energy on the collection screen in a clump pattern. So our knowledge of the system impacts its, its state of being. Okay, that, that was, I don't know if that's, that's fairly profound, okay? Now, as a bit of a, a just to let the cat out of the bag, what the, the mistake that they were making, and we'll see how this works in a minute, was that the physicists that were view, viewed the system that they were observing as being separate from themselves, incorrectly. So let's let's take a look at this. So we get a clue from from the look at, from this look at the nature of reality on a level that's even more fundamental than the subatomic particles. Remember all that empty space that I was talking about um, from the from the level from which those particles are created, which is which are fields ultimately is what they're called. Don't get overwhelmed by every detail of the video or the math of the equations. Um, just uh, absorb what you can and let's see what happens here. This is a computer simulation of empty space. All the bubbles that you see popping and bursting are perturbations of empty space. Particles are constantly being created and destroyed in this emptiness. These particles are really excitations of fields that pervade all of space. What you can see in the world around you are excitations of these fields. In fact, all you can see is really only the excitations of four of the fields. You can see photons or light, which are vibrations in the electromagnetic field. Electrons are vibrations in the electron field. Up quarks and down quarks make up the protons and neutrons and the nucleus and all atoms. They are vibrations in the up quark field and down quark field, respectively. Amazingly, everything that you can see around you, your phone, your desk, flowers and trees, the earth below your feet, everything is composed of just these four fields. But they are more than just these four fields. In fact, everything that we designated as particles in the standard model, the best theory of physics we have, are really excitations or vibrations of their own fields. The total number of fields would be 17, including the Higgs field. Note that space-time itself is thought to be a field, but so far has not been able to be incorporated in quantum field theory. It will be the 18th field. All the so-called particles are really waves. And when I say wave, I don't mean a wave like an ocean wave. The 2D models are just a visual aid, but the wave would actually be three dimensional. Can you see any of these fields? Not really, but you can kind of get an idea by putting a magnet together with some metal lines. The lines that you see are really the magnetic field lines changing due to the magnet. Another way to visualize fields is to imagine the volume. Okay, we're not going to go into that too far, but Neil, Niels Bohr, uh, Niels Bohr, the Dutch physicist, summed it up best when he stated that everything we think of as real is actually made up of that which cannot be considered real. Consciousness itself, by the way, is not material, but it's immaterial, just like the fields illustrated in the video. So again, going back to the double slit experiment to explain how directed consciousness affects the state of the gun slit screen system, what physicists at the time failed to realize was that the observer of the experiment and the system itself are in fact not separate from each other because they are nothing more than physical expressions of the exact same three fields. So it's not surprising that they were enmeshed with each other. And when our patients realize and internalize this fact set, we have paved the way for them to believe that they are in fact capable of creating their own identity and their own reality by directing their own consciousness uh, in the form of guided meditations, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So the implications of this cannot be overstated. The substrate of the entire universe, as he pointed out, are these continuous fields consisting of only energy and information shown above um, that span all of space-time. Every atom in the periodic table is made up solely of the up quarks, down quarks, and electrons derivative of those three fields on the left. 
By the way, these fields are called scalar fields. They're responsible for various particles. The ones that are over here are so fleeting, they, they only exist for a few moments and then they disappear. The gluon fields and, and these fields here, it says interactions force carriers, these are called vector fields and they're responsible for the behavior of the quarks and electrons once they're formed. They're the ones, if, if there were no um, uh, vector fields, the neutrons wouldn't stick together. The, the, the subatomic particles would just fly off all willy-nilly. So there are certain laws that are woven into the fabric of reality that makes this possible, which is an argument that, you know, that I use to maybe make a, a circumstantial argument in favor of some sort of higher power or divine intelligence that's maybe authored this algorithm. Um, every atom in the periodic table is made up solely of the up quarks, down quarks, and electrons that are derivative of those three fields, their epiphenomena. Consciousness is a field. Part, part, particles materialize when, only when observed by a consciousness. Material reality and consciousness are inextricable from each other. Um, one, again, one could argue that the information woven into the fields is the foundation of reality itself as opposed to these fields being the substrate of reality. So, um, in the double slit experiment video, Dr. Quantum was the guy's name, he stated that in the absence of observation, mathematically speaking, all possible realities regarding the state of the unobserved electron, in that case, exist simultaneously in what he called superposition until a conscious observer imposed their awareness on the system, at which point it, uh, the, it went from wave to particle form. One significant implication for superposition comes in terms of instilling hope and self-efficacy in our patients. The fact that directed consciousness determines our reality in this way puts us in the unique position of becoming co-gods, creating our reality as we go along. The responsibility as co-creators of reality by virtue of how we direct our thoughts forces us to be diligent about rooting out things like cognitive distortions, right? If you literally are getting what you think about, it's useful to become conscious of what you're unconsciously thinking about in your own uh, calculus. Uh, this level of self-reflection, also thinking about what we're thinking about, is helpful to expedite the depth and rate of patients' recovery because they have a vested interest in rooting out a pathology that's related to their thought patterns. Patients also realize that the finite signature of their old self that Dispenza talked about in the original video no longer impairs their future possibilities because all possible realities exist simultaneously until acted upon by a conscious. Einstein used to like to say, I like to think that the moon's there when I'm not looking, which um, according to the Copenhagen interpretation, actually uh, it's not, but it would be at least another circumstantial argument in favor of uh, higher power, maybe keeping an eye on the stuff when, that we're not paying attention to. So clinical benefits of internalizing you know, this uh, superposition concept is useful at overcoming hopelessness. Now, let's take a look at Dr. Spence's final point in a lecture that he made with an eye toward how your own exposure to this new material is forming your neural connections in exactly the same way he is about to illustrate in this next clip. Remember, the fields, directed conscious energy, in this case, are fundamental to the entire change process. So what you're about to see is happening to you right now. I said this was an experiential uh, presentation. What you're about to see happens to you and your patients when, when you're working with them. This is why talk therapy works, actually. Understanding this and getting our patients to understand and internalize it yields significant clinical benefits, and I show this presentation to all my patients. And to the extent that I'm able to get them to internalize it, our work proceeds at an alarming rate. I'll stop right after this slide. Learning is making new synaptic connections. Every time you learn something new, this is what's happening in your brain, geniuses. If you learn one bit of information today, your brain did this. Boom. That's learning. Physical evidence as a result of your interaction in the environment. Every time you learn something in your brain, there's a physical change that takes place, and learning is making new connections. Are you with me? Remember, those neurons are made up of quarks and electrons being manipulated by this conscious energy. This is that happens, too. That's learning. If you learn anything this week, you 
fatal footprint. If learning is making new synaptic connections, then if you keep firing the same thoughts over and over again, you're going to wire them in your brain. So then if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining them. And all of a sudden, they develop a long-term relationship. And just like any relationship, the more you communicate, the more they connect. And neurons are exactly the same way. Now, as you begin to learn information, neurons tend to assemble themselves into networks, or what's called neural networks. And neural networks are just gangs of neurons that have fired and wired together to form a community of neurosynaptic connections that's related to a thought, a skill, a habit, behavior, concept. <clears throat> and neural networks are automatic programs. You have a neural network to brush your teeth, to put on makeup, to speak a language, to walk. All of a sudden, those neurons then form a hardware circuitry, but if you keep repeating it, the hardware becomes a software program and it becomes automatic. So then, want to see a thought? Watch. Boom, there's a thought. Right there. Watch again. Boom, that's a thought. You generate more electrical impulses in your brain in one day than all the cell phones on the planet put together. And it's not coming from the candy bar you just ate. You are connected to a greater field. Hmm. Cool stuff, huh? So if we follow the circumstantial breadcrumbs leading to the possibility of some sort of divine author of the algorithm that governs all this stuff, uh, you know, the unified fields whose property science has irrefutably proven, then we're able to put that theory to the test, which is exactly what I, my, my patients have done over the course of the last few years with consistent results. What I've found is that the experiential interplay between what I simply call the universe and the practitioner of this clinical model has resolved spiritual skepticism as quantum guided meditations based upon patients' magic wand thought experiment have invariably yielded synchronistic feedback from the universe without exception. We don't have time to cover quantum entanglement right now, but a, a UTR practitioner would say that in a focused meditative state, we're essentially reaching through the field across space and time, connecting with an entangle, entangled version of our idealized self, whose electromagnetic signature is congruent with that of our current most authentic self. So, our authenticity makes us better receivers of that signal, enabling the universe to work more efficiently in, in merging our present self with that idealized self. There are many quantum-guided meditations on the market, and I have designed many custom ones in my recording studio that reflect my patient's magic wand thought experiments. The guided meditations are really the doing part of the program. Once the principles are laid out, and as, just as with any recovery program, internalization and continuity are critical in maintaining the gains and, and the ongoing growth. Clinical benefits of a field-based change model. Um, improve self-awareness, you're motiv motivated to resolve cognitive distortions. The superposition of all possible realities, that means infinite possible realities. Um, overcomes their fear of their inability to change, creates focus with their magic wand experiment, gets them to start thinking about what they're thinking about. It's beneficial to both the devout and the spiritually skeptical. If nothing else, it explains the mechanism whereby a higher power would work. You can insert any higher power you want. This is the mechanism of interchange between us and the higher power. It overcomes shame. Superposition actually works backwards, too, so I'm not going to get into that today. Non, it's non-judgmental, so there's no writing reflex. Um, you know, we're not, it's not some guy on a throne with a beard telling you the conditions of participation in this. Um, so there's no writing reflex activated in the patient, which is also good for overcoming false ego and that sort of thing. That was probably my biggest problem as I was you know, trying to develop a grasp on spirituality. It improves self-efficacy in the sense that we are literally creating our reality as we go along. It's uh, more powerful than talk therapy in the sense that it's experiential when they actually take that small step of faith to meditate in a guided meditation on their magic wand thought experiment. 
and then they go off and they come back a week later, they can talk about synchronicities and feedback from the universe that they've gotten, without exception. Uh, resolves loneliness and feelings of isolation by virtue of the fact that we're all basically material expressions of the same unified field. Um, it provides compelling circumstantial argument for a higher power whose consciousness might be keeping on that, an eye on that stuff that we're not. It aligns with 12-step programs, enhancing people's ability to more fully engage in the promises and steps 2, 3, and 11. And the science is irrefutable. Um, and of course, there are benefits to us to adopting this model. Uh, there's significant patient buy-in because it's their program, that's their magic wand thought experiment. You get really fast results a great depth of recovery in a short period of time because it's, it, their beliefs change when they start doing it. That's very powerful feedback that they're getting. Complementary to the 12 steps, you usually get two for one patients because the change is so fast and fundamental that if they're in a primary relationship, the codependent person or people don't know what to do and they need to have guidance to explain and, and adapt to the, uh, to the patient's fast fundamental change in identity. Uh, resolve spiritual skepticism with a lot of folks, uh, certainly did with me. There are ongoing aftercare opportunities, uh, as with any any uh, recovery program. It can be done in person or remote. Um, I, it's a, got a lucrative workshop format. Once you internalize this stuff, you can do three and four day workshops. And uh, I mean, that's what I do uh, on the, you know, probably once a month, and I do it in a clinical setting. I do it for treatment centers, for clinicians to get them to um, learn this so that they can use this model for their patients. It's all evidence-based methods. I mean, it, if you, you have to word your notes right, you know, because it's not a proven theory, right? But, you know, you're using CBT, um, regular evidence-based methods, psychoeducation. And it's semi-manualized. Uh, the, the book that I've, I wrote uh, has a chapter-by-chapter clinician's guide so that people can run small groups and you can go through the material and then they can personalize it and then relate to it that way. That'll be coming out in January. Um, I'm not going to waste time with the basic tenets here, um, but uh, uh, I'll leave them up there because I'm going to read one, one passage from chapter 11 in my book. It's how empty space works and then I'm going to call it a day. <clears throat> this was referring to the empty space video. There's no need to become fixated on the details of the video, but for now, take away from the fact that there is literally no such thing as empty space. In fact, it is packed with at least 17 immaterial fields, which we'll explore later in the book. Exactly how pervasive are these fields? Consider for a moment the letters that make up the words on the pages of this book. The letters are actually made up of microscopic dots of ink molecules sprayed onto the pages of the paper that is composed of paper molecules, all of which are composed of atoms that in turn consist of subatomic particles. Each subatomic particle is derivative of perturbations in one of those three respective fields from which everything we see originates. The letters, words, sentences, and ink on the page are being perceived by your brain. Your brain is derivative of the same subatomic particles and field perturbations as is the content and media comprising this book. The neurons that synthesize the ideas contained herein, those in my mind and brain, are derivative of the self-same fields that comprise you, the book, ink, etc. So this is a closed system consisting of me, the author, the content of the book, the information, the media, the, the computer or paper by which the information is being conveyed, the reader, even the air that is between you and me, all of which are derivative of the exact same continuous fields. Given this, one could ask, why not just leave out the middleman? Why is a book even needed? This information was always present within the field, so why don't I just know all this stuff like the author does? To put it in more scientific terms, the fields need not have organized themselves into subatomic particles comprising the neurons in my brain, which all fired in such a manner that I ultimately came up with the content of this book. Remember, my brain and its neurons are derivative of the exact same fields that your brain is. Throughout the entire author, content, reader system, the quantum fields are the common denominator permeating the subjective reader, you, the subjective author, me, and the objective media by which the information is being conveyed from my brain to yours. The medium through which 
This information is transmitted as derivative of the same fields as the source and receiver of the information, whether via electronic screen paper or voice through the air, which is also derivative of, you guessed it, the quantum fields. So we are all inextricably connected by the fields through in which everything in the universe exists. Um, a, an Eastern philosopher would say that the reason why we don't know all this information is because of our imperfect human bodies. Uh, we, if we were in our pure conscious state, we would probably know all of this stuff. But uh, that's maybe one of the beauties of being here as a human being on the planet. And that's everything I know about that for now. So thank you very much for listening. Oh, uh, questions. Anybody have any questions? I understand if you're saturated, too, by the way. No? Okay. Um, tell you what, I've got some books up here. If anybody wants to grab one, uh, you're welcome to do so. And some business cards. If you have questions, follow up questions, you can email me or uh, send a text to Scott my cell phone number. Thank you very much.